Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, to the brilliant Daniel Veer. A nice choice of music this week, Daniel. Who was that on that keyboard, anyway? Uh, I'm David Blight, director of the Gilda Lerman Center. This is one of our, G our occasional Wednesday GLC at lunch events. And today we are very pleased to have Chantel George, who was a fellow with us last spring, uh, spring, early summer, but we did not manage to schedule her talk in then, as I recall. She is now back in her real job, which is at the University of Glasgow in Scotland, and she joins us from there today. Uh, Chantel has her, P uh, hello Chantel, there you are. Uh, Chantel has her PhD from SOAS at the University of London in 2017. Uh, her master's degree from the University of the West Indies in Mona, and uh, her BA from SOAS as well. Uh, she has taught at uh, SOAS in, at the University of London in two different stints. She's also taught at SUNY Oneonta here in the U.S., as well as at, uh, I think, two years at Marist College. And uh, today she's going to talk about uh, her, her project or a portion of her project the book that's under contract with Cambridge University Press, uh, I think still entitled The Yoruba Are on a Rock, Recaptured Africans and the Orisis, Orisis of Granada. Sorry. Uh, any rate, but today we're going to hear about the Kola nut. And as everyone knows, the world is all about commodities uh, then, since, now, and probably forever. Anyone on this event probably knows a fair amount about the slave trade, uh, slaves, firearms, uh, et cetera, ex gold, et cetera, et cetera, in this enormous centuries long exchange uh, that became the Atlantic slave trade. But less is known about the importance of the colon. And that's what we're gonna hear about today. So without further ado, uh, Chantel, a big welcome again to the GLC and to our audience. We've got a great audience today, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. So I would like to start by thanking Michelle, David, Danielle, and Melissa, too, at the GLC for the various ways they supported me during the fellowship and for, of course, hosting me today. And my fellowship at the GLC really afforded me time to write my current book project on the Yoruba of Grenada, that these recaptured Af Africans and their religious legacies, particularly Orisha worship. And I made great strides in that project. Um, so I'm very grateful for that. And also allowed me to dig deep into the kola nut, which I'm presenting on today. And I also had enriching discussions on commodity histories in the Caribbean space with Nira Wickramasinghe um, at Leiden. He was also a fellow um, at GLC in June 2023. So I'm really grateful for those opportunities. It's really informed both projects. So I'll just share my PowerPoint. Okay, so my talk today examines what a relatively um, under-researched African commodity, what the colonel can tell us about the relationship between slavery, colonization, and consumption practices. And I've been thinking about the colonel for many years. Um, and the first time I heard about the colonel was during my field work in Grenada when I was talking to the descendants of recaptured Africans and an individual called Benedict Andrew told me that there was a colonel tree in Grenada. And I just thought about it, um, but didn't develop and didn't research further until a couple of years later. But anyway, he told me how the colonel was integral to Orisha traditions in Grenada, uh, particularly divination. And so um, I later picked up this research. And only later did I realize the European histories of the nut and which informs this project. So from the late 19th century, explorers, bioprospectors, homeopathic chemists reported on this, the discovery of the African kola nut or 
Cola Acuminata, which is one variety, and they hoped that it would supersede the demands and interests in chocolate, tea and coffee and bolster imperial ambitions and offer miraculous health benefits to the European consumers. Several European and American companies, most well-known Coca and Pepsi Cola, used the nut in their various concoctions. This nut had a deep, rich history which preceded the 19th century. So whilst the nut was new to European audiences, it certainly wasn't new to African peoples. And for centuries, African and African descended peoples cultivated, consumed, and established trading networks in the nut. Yet, I argue that global histories of commodities, sugar, tobacco, cocoa, cotton, um, have a common thread, and that is their production by African labor, driven by European consumption practices in Europe and North America. And few of these studies examine Africans as distributors and consumers of global commodities across the Atlantic world, failing to recognize the impact of Africans through the life histories of commodities. So I'm interested in how people of African descent participated in consumption practices and distribution networks and how might studying these commodities tell us about commodity histories, tell us about racial slavery. And I want to add a layer of complexity to these existing representations of Africans as mere laborers. How did Africans distribute, consume cola and what can this tell us about the connection between British consumption cultures and its imperial endeavors. So I want to focus on four key areas, Africans as consumers, distributors, European consumption practices, especially focusing on Scotland where I am now, and lastly, the relationship between European consumption and imperialism. So Africans as consumers, um, the intellectual and technical knowledge of Africans was critical in the production and consumption of cola in Africa and the Caribbean. According to one pamphlet that I found, it questioned how an item produced by, quote, unskilled natives, close quote, who were supposedly ignorant about its ingredients possess any remedi remedial value. At the core of this query is a claim about knowledge production. Could Africans know what Europeans did not? And only by examining Africans as, and by examining Africans as producers of raw commodities, this perpetrates the idea that African consumption practices were either non-existent, narrow, barbaric, or superstitious, or they were non-existent. And both interpretations support this idea that undergirded imperialism that sustained European contact will somehow expose Africans to commodities. They will learn the value of commodities and um, be consumers of European goods. And these ideas about African consumption practices, I think are still embedded in the historical writings of um, global commodities. But I think things are beginning to change. Um, two books come into mind. The first is Deval, African Roots of Marijuana, published in 2019, placing cannabis in a global context and centering African consumption practices. And also Diavinon's book, A Ritual Geology 2022, which centers on African knowledge and cosmology in gold mining. And so these books really place the focus on African consumption, African knowledge, and I hope the cola nut will do the same or similar. So African knowledge systems were critical to cola's extensive production and consumption in Western Africa. As this slide shows, it was indigenous um, to Western Africa. It was produced in Western Africa. It is. The nut seed grows in pods and trees, which can grow about 40 feet high, and a tree can produce 500 to 800 pods per crop. The trees bear fruit in seven to six to seven years after planting, and the color of the cola varies from red to white. There are around 40 species, of which there are two major varieties. 
The first is Kalanatida, native to the forest zones of Sierra Leone, Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana, and was most important in the trade between the forest and the savanna. And there was demand among Muslims for this particular variety. Kalanatida contains 2.5% caffeine. Interestingly, and I'll have this on the next slide and I'll return to the previous slide in a bit, but the temne underlined in yellow there of West Africa referred to cola by uh, cola. So it's interesting to think about how this name has was adopted by the scientific community um, and Coca-Cola, and I'll go talk about Coca-Cola later. So the other, um, the second variety is Cola acuminata, which is native to the rainforest and savanna areas of Eastern Africa from Nigeria to Gabon and was significant in local trade. And it contains less caffeine than Cola natida, just above 1%. Although there are tem there's a temne word for um, cola, which um, I argue is its scientific origin, um, the world of Coca-Cola in Atlanta subscribes the narrative that it was, or that Coca-Cola was an invented catchy phrase incorporating coca, the real form of cocaine, and the African cola nut, and denies there was such thing as cola itself. So cola nut contains caffeine. It contains theobromine, which is also found in chocolate and tea, which is said to stimulate skeletal activity, lowers blood pressure, and decreases the risk of heart disease. And it's also good for conditions such as asthma. It also contains cholinin, which stimulates the heart. Cola nuts are known to aid, to aid digestion, and then can also suppress hunger and thirst. And Africans are well aware of these benefits and they employed cola in wide ranging ways and complex ways across Western African societies. I'm keen to explore the idea of the cola nut as an anti-commodity, thinking about how it sustained individuals spiritually and physically within communities in Africa, but also outside Africa. Anti-commodities can be understood by thinking about what people do with commodities beyond its economic utility and how they might confront or challenge colonial ideas about these commodities. So within Western Africa, coconut was used as a masticatory. It was chewed, uh, a dye, a form of currency, an aphrodisiac. It was critical in life events, political and ritual performance, and the mediating disputes. And African historians, Lovejoy, Brooks, and Abaka have shown that cola grown and distributed and consumed initially by Africans later became an important pharmaceutical and tonic item across the Atlantic world. And there are several early narratives of um, the cola nut within Western Africa. For example, the Portuguese traveler Lopez, who traveled to the Kingdom of Congo in the 16th century, wrote that cola nut improved the taste of water and that it was in common use. It was chewed to relieve thirst as well, strengthen the stomach and refreshing stale meat. This knowledge was clearly gleaned from African peoples. There are also accounts by a Scottish naval officer, Clapperton, who described that among the Hausa of Western Africa in the early 1800s, cola nut was used as a body dye. Rancon, a French explorer in Senegambia region in the late 19th century, observed that certain ethnic groups swore upon the cola as done upon the Bible in Christian, Christian countries. So it was used as used in dispute. So in disputes, they would swallow the cola as part of this oath-taken tradition. It was also used as a form of currency. And in the early 18th century, a French writer noted that cola was a form of currency in Sierra Leone. He wrote, it was so, it was, valued so highly that 10 nuts are considered a gift worthy of a king. And of course, Chinya Chebi, the critically acclaimed Nigerian novelist wrote in his book, Things Fall Apart, 1950s, 
wrote about the Kola nut and its integral use within sociality. He who brings Kola brings life. It's, it was an honor, it is an honor to break the Kola nut. And this was followed by thanking the ancestors for life, health and protection. So I'm interested in the literature, African literature about the Kola nut. Uh, these were a few books that I found at Northwestern University years ago. I um, want to understand how the Kola nut was understood in Western African societies, and I'm yet to conduct field work within Western Africa. I'm also intrigued by how Kola is represented in African writing systems. So here I have a, a symbol of the Adinkra, uh, a writing system from present day Ghana, um, and it emphasizes what the Kola nut represents affluence, power, abundance, plenty, et cetera. So how do African writing systems capture the Kona nut? I'm also concerned with objects associated with Kola. So storage items, for example, um, this first one, Art Institute of Chicago, where this a woman is holding, depicting a woman, or the object is in the form of a, a kneeling woman holding a rooster made to hold Kola nuts. Kona's again are shared with guests here as a gesture of hospitality. In the surface, on the surface is rubbed with bluing powder, 19th century laundry aid, and the color blue is of special significance to the Yoruba associated with water, water duties, and cool. Here at the Hunter Museum in Glasgow, just a few minutes from where I am, there are Kola related objects, Kola nut itself, um, and Frank Willett, uh, who donated, uh, a professor who donated the Kola nuts to Hunter in 1984, mentioned this caffeine rich stimulant, how it was famous around the world, used in Coca Cola, and Nigeria it was grown and chewed for as a stimulant, and it was used critically in divination. I don't have an image here, seem to have lost it, but it's an intriguing one of uh, a church missionary society agent who was in southeastern Nigeria and uh, drew an image of body art done by, carried out by Igbo women, and they used indigo to apply the pattern. It occurred in a home where a young woman, where young women were trained for marriage um, and they wrote, many of the girls in the home come straight from paganism and have practiced the art themselves. The writer believe that increased contact with Western ideas would derail this practice. Um, I'd like to explore this further. What's the significance of the items depicted in the image? For example, there were dog hairs, several body parts, the throats and necks of young men. What does this mean? And how does such art reflect the significance of the nut within the Igbo society? And how can we use cases like these to write a gendered history of the nut? And oral narratives will, of course, will of course be critical in understanding and answering these questions. So in Jamaica, um, enslaved Africans, again, were knowledgeable about the art. They were the first cultivators of the nut, and it was they were instrumental in the spread around the island. In the 19th century, it remained after the apparatus of plantation slavery. Some of the apparatus um, was dis disintegrated. So while some of the buildings may have crumbled, the Kola nut remained in Jamaica, according to um, a scholar, um, a health officer called Niche, which I'll um, bring up later. Enslavers weaponized the Kona in their domination of enslaved peoples. From the 18th century, Kona was imported into Jamaica to prevent thirst and fatigue among the enslaved. It was also thought to prevent suicides. Reportedly, an agent of a large sugar estate requested a supply of Kona seedlings from an African trader to prevent suicides and low spirits. Enslaved Africans are from the Gold Coast on Jamaican plantations, according to the Detroit-based druggist this first quote here, were given cola to avert attacks of despondency. Another druggist referred to a case recorded in Jamaica by a doctor in which cola apparently halted an epidemic of suicide, which threatened at one time to depopulate the estate on which it occurred. How can we use the cola to center, to emphasize stories of resistance? 
And one way to do this is to place a spotlight on how bonded peoples employed the nut to mitigate slavery. So I refer to Han Sloan, this British physician and naturalist who wrote that the cola nut was treated a range of health problems in Jamaica and it was known as Bissy after the Akan Bessie. So again, we can see there's this linguistic legacy of the enslaved Akan. And again, I put this um, Adinkra writing system to emphasize this legacy. Han Sloan wrote about the nut, um, not to great lengths. And he would also um, use the Akan name for um, the nut, Bissy or Bitchy. So in the late 19th century, the cola nut um, and Niche, and I'll bring up Niche again, um, reportedly used the nut. It was reportedly used by the descendants of enslaved peoples as a stomach kick to increase appetite um, and to aid digestion. In the Brazilian candomblé, the Cuban tradition of Santeria and the Grenadian Orisha worship, Africans recreated their religious traditions in several ways. Ways They used colonel grown in Africa, imported it, but they also, where it wasn't grown, substituted it with locally grown items. It could be colonel itself or the coconut shells, for example. They also combined the color nut with Euro-Christian iconography, the cross, for example, or they placed it in spaces shared with adherents of South Asian heritage. In Brazil, in the mid 19th century, an account recognized cola as a lucrative item of export from Angola to South America. In this quote here, um, from Lagos, again, Kona is recognized um, as a principal import from into Brazil from Lagos, used by the descendants of African slaves. There are several Afro-Brazilian and Brazilian traders who traded the nut between West Africa and Brazil. And the movement of cola between Africa and Brazil was, was African-led, as I mentioned, also Afro-Brazilian traders. Formerly enslaved Brazilians were engaged with trade, especially between Bahia and Lagos. And this really emphasizes the consumption practices of Afro-Brazilians and how these practices shaped Atlantic trading networks. Although cola was naturalized in Brazil by the early 19th century, many candomblé priests held that cola exported from Africa contained more spiritual energy or more power than the local variety. And Vogt writes about this in his study of candomblé. In Cuba, cola was among the objects imported from Europe and Africa, which furnished altars and garment, garments within Santeria. Cola then constituted the re-Africanization of altars and garments in the late 19th century Cuba. The use of these items did not mean an essential return to African origins, rather such trade goods were used selectively and could be substituted with local items. For example, whilst imported cola became essential in Yoruba of divination, Santeria priests substituted the nut with coconut to serve the same purpose. On the island of Trinidad, cola was used within Orisha worship. The anthropologist James Hook described that during his initiation in 1989, he had ingested olive oil, rum, and raw obi. So this is a Yoruba term for cola nut seeds, which are obtained from a cola nut tree there. To the north of Trinidad is the island of Grenada where cola nut, as I mentioned at the beginning, was central to Orisha traditions. The earliest reference I found was in the 1880s by a European officer, colonial officer, Hesketh Bell. His guide, a black woman, directed him to a parting among a bush and calabash trees where an altar could be found. And his, his guide informed him that Africans 
Creoles and also descendants of South Asian indentured laborers came to this spot to pray and dance. On the altar was a broken cutlass. In front of it were jugs, flowers, and cola nuts. And he observed that the rough wooden cross was out of place in that outlandish company. And I use this quote to talk about how peoples of various backgrounds recreated these spaces, recreated their traditions using the cola nut along with um, other items. It's significant to note that the cutlass here in this depiction represents Ugun, um, which was crucial to Orisha work. This deity was crucial to Orisha traditions. The Scottish chemist, and I'll move on to the role of Africans in the distribution of the color nut, but just to say that the Scottish chemist, JC Cottage, who I'll refer to later, showed some awareness of the importance of the color nut to African descended peoples. In 1980s, this chemist wrote that the mastication of the color nut by Africans in Bahia, Bahia Brazil, um, represents the fact that the African does not forget however far he may be from his native country. So I find it fascinating that this Scottish chemist, whose small book on the cola nut is in the National Library of Scotland, recognised, had some awareness of the role of the nut outside Scotland and outside um, the continent of Africa. So looking at cola nut is as a subsistence item rather than an item of commerce is key here. Cola was imbued with memories of the enslaved past and present, offering them, their descendants, and other marginalized peoples, critical spaces for sociability, healing, and religious renewal. So the role of Africans in the distribution of colonite is important too. Um, we can talk about the distribution within Western Africa. Um, There's this image from the National Art. Uh, archives at Kew, which shows colonites embarking from Western Africa, presumably to the Gold Coast, um, but I'm not sure of the destination. It doesn't mention it here. We could also think about local distances, how the colonite was distributed over smaller scales. Um, Barbot wrote in the 18th century how the cohenut quenches the thirst, improves the taste of water, and that people, black people carried it about themselves, chewing it all day. So in 1894, the druggist Frederick Stern claimed that they were the first company to offer the nut to the American market. They're an American druggist and argued that the color nut was unquestionably introduced from slaving vessels. McNeish, Niche, who I mentioned was a Jamaican health officer in Port Royal, Jamaica, supported this idea. He wrote in the 19th century that the color nut was a sole and valued treasure of a slave. So there are some competing narratives, accounts, questioned the identities of the introducers. Um, was it introduced by enslavers who apparently kindly imported the nut for the prevention of thirst, fatigue and suicides? Or is it bought, was it brought by exiled Africans, as Niche would say, um, the sole and valued treasure of, from their African homelands? All histories from Brazil may substantiate this claim. Voix, in his study of the role of plants in the Brazilian Candomblé, highlights narratives of the introduction of cola by the descendants of enslaved Africans, not cola nut per se, but also other items um, such as rice. Many Afro-Brazilians, he maintained, believe that the cola nut, rice and other commodities were smuggled um, as seeds hidden in the hair of individuals or their clothing or a magical pouch. Although he writes that enslaved Africans would have had limited ability to carry cola nut from their homelands and onto the slave ship into the Americas, he writes that it may have been more likely that crewmen on slave ships who employed enslaved Africans as deckhands could have transported this nut to the Americas. So competing ideas about um, 
who were the introducers of Kona into the Americas. Carney and Rosmaroff highlight such narratives concerning rice, rice hidden in the hair of a child by a mother, for example. So again, this um, idea from oral narratives that Africans were agents of dispersal. And, the, and, and, and such narratives also help us to consider the, the ways in which enslaved peoples gave meaning to their traumatic experiences, the role of rice, cola, um, and so on in helping enslaved peoples to resist bondage and survive. There is clear evidence that enslaved and free Africans distributed the nut within and across various geographies. For example, in the eternal market economy of Jamaica, uh, the nut was used by enslaved and newly freed black agriculturists, agriculturalists and from the mid-19th century by Afro-Brazilians training the nut between West Africa and Brazil. In Jamaica, it was reported in the 19th century by Niche that the colour nut had experienced an increased diffusion in Jamaica, and Niche was really interested in the colour nut. Um, he was one of these individuals that hoped that it would be the new commodity subseding um, or superseding coffee and other commodities um, he wrote that it could be found among Kingston markets where it was bought and sold among the black population. The same is true today. So in 2014, it was the Kona was known as a treatment for chikungunya. And on the right um, bottom hand is um, a packaged version of Bissy herbal tea as a tea bag there. According to Edmund de Backer's seminal work on cola, the nuts reached Brazil from the 17th century. And in the 18th and early 19th century, cola nuts medicinal benefits were recognized, especially for the prevention of thirst and fatigue. In Brazil in 1890, a dispatch transmitted by the consul of Brazil noted that the West African carriers at the port who chewed cola were able to carry heavy loads than the Africans born in Brazil. He reported that African carrier, carriers were constantly masticating cola, which enabled them to endure labor and fatigue. And I think these days, these ideas are critical. We can see them, um, in justifying the use of Africans as laborers. Um, we can see this in Brazil, but we can also see this in Africa and I'll return to that too later. So it's important to foreground the circulation of goods by free and enslaved Africans within local and broader transatlantic economic exchanges. The other element that I focus on um, is how African consumption practices were mirrored by European consumers from the late 19th century. In the, in the 1880s, the Scotsman, a Scottish newspaper, reported on the marvelous discovery of the colour nut, encouraging its immediate cultivation where it could be cultivated. Travellers brought back botanical specimens which were stored in vibrariums and supplied them to chemists and, and tonic and confectionery agents who advocated for their curative abilities for digestive um, disorders, cardiac orders, and so on. And there was significant trade which commenced from the British colonies in West Africa and the Caribbean to support cola as a key ingredient in the various soft drinks, tonics, lozenges, bitters, and syrups and chocolates that were produced in the 19th century. Uh, this is an image from uh, advertising J.C. Pottage, this chemist who I mentioned earlier, um, his store in Glasgow and Edinburgh, and a range of cola-infused goods that were produced and who they were marketed to. So high in caffeine, um, it's understandable that it was marketed to cyclists, athletes, students, and businessmen. J.C. Pottage was a Glasgow-based chemist and president of the Homeopathic Pharmaceutic Association. He was dubbed the Apostle of the North because it was reported that he was the first to introduce the colonel into Scotland 
producing a variety of base cola infused products, as this ad shows, from the late 19th century. In 1891, the British journal, The Homeopathic World, wrote that no one has done more to introduce cola into common use in this country than Mr. Pottage. And again, uh, really, this really emphasizes that um, Scots were the leading um, introducers the, um, of the cola into Britain. Concux there were the concoctions of another chemist, M.P. Um, Thompson. He actually scooped a medal at the Edinburgh exhibition of 1980, and his concoction became known as prize medal cola. He wrote that there were worthless imitations on the market, but his goods were distinctive and he registered La Cola as a, as a name. By the 19th century, the late 19th century, Thomas had established an extensive and influential clientele, including the elite of um, Glasgow and his establishment in Edinburgh enjoyed a wide measure of substantial support. There were other Glasgow-based chemists, John McKay and Company, who produced Sparkling Cola and Cola Cafe. The, later, the latter claimed to be the purest and finest coffee essence on the market, so it was made with a stimulating and invigorating cola nut along with coffee. And this was displayed until the 1920s. So Thompson, this Glasgow-based chemist that um, I've just mentioned in the ads there, promoted the rigor enhancing cola to the wary industrial worker by placing a terracotta statue of wrestling athletes in their window front, in his window front. Advertisers, as I mentioned, appealed to athletes, surgeons, ministers, physicians, and cola, and full cola. Um, and it was said to brighten the intellect and stimulating um, and stimulated their mental faculties. Cola's marketing was also gendered, and I find that I found that advertisers and chemists describe the benefits for women during household cleaning and caring for the children. And I certainly want to look more into that. Intriguingly, several Scottish companies, including bars who produced iron brew, manufactured cola-flavored beverages from the, eight, the late 1890s. Leishman writes in Consumer Nationalism and Bars Iron Brew that following the invention of carbonated cola drinks in 1873, several Scottish firms were reportedly selling Scotch cola, sparkling champagne cola, Edinburgh cola. And in 1879, a trade notice informed enterprising American bottlers of the popularity of cola drinks in Scotland, and this encouraged them to introduce cola into the US market. Since Pemberton, the creator and inventor of Coca-Cola in Atlanta, went on to launch Coca-Cola a few, a few years after its use within Scotland, Scotland is considered um, by some as the national origin of this class of beverage. So again, the role of Scots as leading in introducing or um, creating um, cola-infused beverages. It's intriguing how the adoption of cola by the Scottish reportedly inspired American consumption practices. And I believe this makes a strong case for the influence of this African commodity, its uses, sociality, medicine on global consumption practices. And I'm keen to explore how African communities in Europe can today consume cola and whether this encourages us to rethink European consumption in terms of who is consuming and for what purposes. The final theme um, that I'm examining is the relationship between European beverages and lozenges um, and racial capitalism and imperialism. According to J.C. Potter, the Scottish chemist, cola was unknown to the civilised world until it was captured in the writings of imperial in, uh, explorers. Imperial explorers who opened up areas to European commerce and violent conquest. Prominent among them were several Scots. I found narratives uh, of English, American explorers who would emphasize the medicinal, social, and religious use of the nut within West and West Central Africa, often practicing cola mastication themselves 
during their lengthy expeditions. Mungo Park is a Scottish explorer who traveled up, who traveled to the upper Niger River in 1796. And he wrote about Kola's use as a water purifier and its extensive trade in the area. Gordon Liang reportedly was the first European to reach Timbuktu, observed its refreshing, Kola's refreshing policies and its employment in courtship traditions. David Livingston was offered the nut and he consumed it himself, recognizing its properties as a tonic and fever uh, preventative. William Blakey also conceived the nut and recalled it as a marker of favor and friendship and its centrality, centrality in Yoruba religion, discussing his interest in securing it as a botanical specimen. I am unsure whether he did, but it's something that I need to look into. George Eliot traveled to the continent with cola chocolate, so um, a variety that was produced within Scotland um, and consuming consuming it during a bout of fever within um, Africa. And he praised it as a powerful stimulant and remedy. European imperialist explorers were invoked by Kolonat advertisers who styled themselves as empire buildings, builders, promoting the exploration and extraction of Africa for the benefit of the European consumer. Enhanced by new innovations in poster and print technology in the 1890s, advertisers circulated racialized images of an infantile, exotic Africa bereft of knowledge. Africans were constructed as ideal workers on imperial plantations. And it was argued that color consumption enabled Africans, as we can see with the case with Brazil, but also Africans on the continent to perform hard labor with minimal nourishment. And reportedly, um, cola consumption had led to the comfort and welfare of their descendants during slavery. These are some of the claims that were made by cola advertisers or those who produced pamphlets, medicinal pamphlets, which mentioned the cola nut, clearly minimizing the brutality of slavery and colonial rule. And so this advert is interesting because again, it advocates for cola's cure uh, or, or easing some of the symptoms of asthma. So we can think about some of the language and the imagery here. Um, for example, in the last paragraph here, for ages and native African tribes were in a rough way familiar with the remarkable powers possessed by the Nazis, so acknowledgement that their knowledge was important, but in a rough way familiar, and had it almost wholly to themselves. Theirs was the dark continent and the fullness thereof, vitalizing or deadly as the case might be, um, and speaks about its influence within Africa, um, beyond or more than the gold and gems found. Pictures of warring tribes, Africans in huts, dressed um, minimally, um, and then the advert of this medicinal pamphlet, you know, foregrounds an imperial explorer um, and Africans carrying, presumably, uh, um, a load of cola And I found it intriguing that such imagery um, can also be found in 20, 21st century um, cola advertising. So this wild, exotic, unknowing Africa, centering European discovery. Again, this is not always the case, but um, I did find this in an example of Viva Cola, a Swiss company. When one navigates to their website, if you're interested in doing that, it reads, Back in the 1930s, the founders of Viva Cola sent employees on a quest to Cameroon, the land of cola nuts, to find this mysterious fruit and bring it back to Switzerland. It reads, we can't, it continues, we can't say much, we can't say for sure how much of this is true, but what we do know is that in 1937, this bitter, caffeine-rich seed popped up in Zurich, and in 1938, Viva Cola was introduced to the Swiss public. So we can see her typical objects we might associate with exploration of the African bush, quote unquote. 
the backpack, the hat with um, the European flag. On their website also is this scene reminiscent of Conrad's depiction of a dark continent. Again, centering European exploration here. So by way of conclusion, African knowledge and practices shape the way cola was used across the Atlantic world. From at least the 13th century, a cola nut trade was developed across the Sahara. And Paul Lovejoy writes about this, and um, there's evidence of an earlier trade as well. Um, but here, cola nut was a prized commodity. These sophisticated practices were captured by several Europeans during colonial expeditions. We took interest in these practices, often consuming cola themselves. Women in early 20th century Igbo land, and I'm thinking about this body art image that I didn't show because I couldn't find it, were able to assert the significance and meanings of the cola nut under European domination. So even though, you know, these missionaries are writing about how um, Igbo women are using the cola nut and hoping that the practices are eradicated. Um, it's fascinating that this drawing really um, can be read to show um, their resistance to those processes, those European processes. Also centuries prior in the Americas, cola was appropriated for continuing the degradation and exploitation of bonded peoples. Enslaved peoples used the color nut to push back against this for healing and spiritual renewal. British consumption practices and American practices too were shaped by imperialism. And the language of adverts often reflected this. So it's critical to acknowledge how the histories of slavery and colonization were integral to global commodities and the color nut shows this and how these bear on the histories of Europe, including the beverage industry, for example, Coca-Cola or sparkling cola. So um, that's the end of my talk. And I look forward to your questions and, and thoughts. There we go. Uh, thank you so much, Chantel. Uh, this was terrific. I mean, in your research, I find stunning across time and space. Um, in fact, that that would be the first question I want to throw. We got a bunch of questions in the mm -hmm. Q&A. I'll get to those. But you traverse an incredible range of chronology here. It's at least these three centuries, almost four, and an incredible temporal range. This colonist indigenous to various parts of West Africa, mm -hmm. spread all over the Americas uh, mm -hmm. all the time. What would you compare it to in terms, I mean, what could we compare it to in terms of other African, other than slaves themselves, other African commodities? What other commodities traveled so well as did the cola nut and indeed became eventually uh, not native, but grown in Brazil and many other places. What would mm -hmm. you compare this to in sh terms of a sheer commodity that traveled over these four centuries of primarily the slaving business? Well, that's a fascinating question. And I don't know the answer to. Um, that's all right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so many, you know, for years and, years and years, we have studied this transformation of Africans into the Americas, all over the Americas, mm. in terms of cultural practices, in terms of all sorts of things. And yeah. there's no, mm. but the, the cola nut is an example of something that came even in people's hair, as you point mm. out. It came in um. pockets, it came in, well, eventually it came in huge bags. But um, I don't know what to compare it to. I mean, it's it's interesting. Uh, I mean, you jogged my memory now. Um, well, and it had so many uses too, right? It's, yeah. It's, 
the world's always after stimulants. <laughs> I mean, I guess one can think about rice and the work of Judith Carney, you know, African rice, um, especially in the US South. Right. If it's not the rice itself, it's the techniques that surround the production of rice and then knowledge of how to right. produce rice. Yeah, you know, I did, yeah, but I'm struggling to think of uh, other commodities. I'm sure there are some. Um, well, some yeah, Af maybe. Yeah, some African cloths or whatever, but, yeah. but this, mm -hmm. this is extraordinarily uh, powerful, if not unique example of an African commodity that traveled so far. And right. I'm struck at, at your 20th century evidence. Amazing, you know, how this becomes so mm. Scottish and then so <laughs> American with Coca-Cola and on and on. Right. And, uh, anyway, I'll go to, I, we got a lot of questions piling up here. So let me, let me get into some of them. I want to start with your colleague in Glasgow, uh, Jelmer Voss wants to know, uh, he says, West Africans chewed cola, East Africans chewed coffee. Coffee also grew in places like Sierra Leone. Any evidence that West African, West Africans chewed coffee? <laughs> oh, Yama, I'm glad you're here. That's a very specific question. Um, West Africans, coffee. Um, I have no evidence of this, um, <laughs> but I wonder if Yama does, I know he does extensive research uh -huh. on coffee. Um, so I'd love to throw that question um, back at him or suggest, um, uh, you know, sources that I could use to find out. Um, sure. Well, it, again, it's fascinating how these things travel. We have an anonymous attendee who wants to know if the cola nut was used as currency uh, in the purchase of captives within mm. West Africa. Was it part of part of the trade within West mm. Africa in trading for people? Yeah, that's a brilliant question. It's something that I haven't found, mm -hmm. but I, you know, I've looked, I've tried to look through some of the trading networks at uh, documents T series mm. at the National Archives, and I found no evidence of this. Um, I'm thinking that it could have been used with, you know, I guess my guess is maybe in conjunction with other commodities, um, but certainly was used in terms of welcoming um, or rituals associated with um, sociality, welcoming European traders. Um, right, and I need to emphasize that more. It's kind Sorry? Of a, it's kind of a mediator, isn't it, in trade? That's uh, right. Better, better have some cola nuts with you so to speak. Right. Uh, it's just fascinating. Our colleague Ed Ruggemer here, whom I think you know, wants to know if yes. Coke or Bissy ever became one of the minor exports from Caribbean islands like Jamaica. Did it become itself a Jamaican export? It did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I found more evidence for Jamaica, I guess the scale of Jamaica itself. So certainly at the National Archives, the Blue Books, yeah. Uh, and I, I need to go back to the data, but there were large numbers, large amounts of cola being exported um, from Jamaica and other parts of the British Caribbean, including the island of Grenada that I focus on, to North America. We could think about the proximity of North America and Jamaica, but also to Britain. So I would say that it was a major exporter of, of cola nut into uh, Europe and North America. Mm. Um, Certainly. So if, if if people in the American South possessed cola nuts, they're probably getting them from Jamaica. Mm. Yeah, and that's something that I wanted to find out more about. You know, where did Pemberton's cola nut come from? I know yeah. it said that, you know, Af you know, it was very expensive to import from Africa. Um so I was I was thinking, you know, where did these where did color nut from the American South come from? But I haven't found any evidence of um, this direct link between Coca Cola and Caribbean yeah. cola. But it's something that I could um, definitely explore further because it would make sense. Everybody's mm -hmm. always finding more research for you. Um, uh, exactly. I guess Mr. Cody wants or says 
African elders in the city of Liverpool used the kola nut as part of a slavery remembrance day. Today, apparently. Wow. So, so she wanted you to talk a little bit more about the uses of the kola nut for commemorative rituals. Mm. I suppose. But, but there's an example apparently from Liverpool. Yeah, so yeah, I spoke about how I'm interested in how African communities in the UK consume cola. And that is a fascinating example. And I certainly like to look into that, you know, how it was part of, uh, you know, the remembrance of slavery, honoring the ancestors. Yeah. Um, I, I found some communities in Scotland, so an Igbo community that, 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 that use cola and I'm trying to get in contact with them. I was unsuccessful. Um, I did find some evidence that the Black cultural archives of the use of kola nut in, in rituals, but in remembering slavery, it's fascinating, right? Even to think about how it was used, yeah. what it what it could mean, right? So was it used by, you know, continental Africans or was it used by descendants of enslaved peoples and how might they have interacted or differently? How might these meanings of kola nut be different by different peoples. But I think that's fascinating how slavery is used to commemorate slavery. Um, yeah. So I'll say you to look into that further. Well, it's the role of taste, isn't it? Taste yeah. and and stimulants and all the powers mm -hmm. that go with it. Another guest, Pat Willard, has just suggested one comparative commodity might be okra. Ah. An African product that yeah. traveled still travels well all over the Americas. Yeah. That's a big That's deal a in the South, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, good friend Lois McMillan, writing in from Grant Pass, Oregon, where she teaches. She's frequently mm -hmm. a, a guest on our events. She's a teacher, and her class is apparently watching this. Uh, uh, her own son and others spent a year in Ghana, Accra, and uh, mm -hmm. the students are wondering if the kola nut is is very special in Ghana as well as the other places you've mentioned. Anyway, they mm -hmm. have a particular interest in Ghana. She's probably got them writing papers about it. <laughs> mm -hmm. What about Ghana? Yeah, so Ghana is very important. So a major site of kola production uh -huh. in the 19th, 20th centuries. And Edmund Abaka has written a very important work called Kola is God's Gift. And he, he documents this extensive trade, its relationship to imperialism, um, and also some of the social and medicinal uses. I personally haven't looked at Ghana unless it's, you know, through a backer's work. Um, but yeah, Ghana is a major site of production. So um, Kola Night is certainly coming to North America and Europe from Ghana. So it would have been... Past heavily involved in all that exchange along the slave coast there uh, by the, well, my goodness, by the 16th, 17th, 18th and 19th centuries. Oh, yes. Yeah. So even going far back as that, yes, yeah, some early colonial um, writers, 16th, 17th century, they've written about uh, yeah, the colonial traditions in, in Ghana, um, in the Gold Coast. That's an important point, too. Another guest, Nyla Garrard, asks what microclimates are, you know, what do we know about this, are ideal for growing the kola nut? Could the kola nut be grown in the U.S. South? Or was it? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I didn't find any evidence that it was grown in the U.S. South. Um, uh -huh. I'll be intrigued to know maybe if people experimented, maybe Pemberton and other producers of these kola infused goods may have experimented maybe to try and save money from the imports from Africa. Yeah. Um, but you haven't. Yeah. Oh, but I do know it was grown in Sri Lanka, India. Oof. Yeah, certainly Sri Lanka and India. Um, so I think that's fascinating too that it's outside the Atlantic world. It was also yeah. grown. Yeah, well it's it's amazing how you're connecting dots here on a on a thing like a little nut. Um uh, our uh, our good friend of the GLC, Adi Van Dyke, wants to know. I guess she may be referring to your larger book here. Uh, she would like to hear you talk a little more about the reenslavement mm -hmm. 
of Africans within the Caribbean or the selling and reselling, I guess. Mm -hmm. That's what she means. Um, just can you give give some further mm -hmm. thoughts on that process once people were in the Caribbean uh, being sold from within, you know, within the islands? Yeah, so, yeah, um, so my work doesn't look at this. I'm happy to talk about my um, my book project. Yeah. But I'm just thinking, it doesn't come to mind, but I know the Transatlantic Slave Trade Database has um, some information on inter intra-American slave trading. So that might be useful, but certainly Africans were um, resold around the Caribbean. Yeah, Even yeah. last week, I was looking, I was talking to my students about there was an Obia trial in Jamaica, I believe in the 18th century. Is it the woman of the Popo country? Yeah. Um, and she was, re you know, sold into slavery to uh, um, two Cubans for practicing Obia. So that's just a, a small example. But my own research looks at bonded labor in Grenada um, after slavery. So this system of indentureship where in the island of Grenada, 3000 uh, Africans were indentured on plantations, mainly producing sugar, but also cocoa. And within the British Caribbean, around 50,000 um, were indentured in the mid uh, to late 19th century. So the system of indentureship is a form of bonded labor. And one of the things that are so interesting to me is that, you know, um, some of these um, individuals were Yoruba and so were able to um, carry and um, rethink their Yoruba traditions and the colonel was integral to this. Um, so I look at Yoruba communities in the British Caribbean and particularly Grenada. Could you say another word there a little bit about, because this is a 19th century phenomenon. So after the end of slavery in the British Empire, slavery in the French Empire, legally, uh, the Spanish are still doing it, but uh, indentured, indentured. How were their lives different under indentured servant uh, capacity? How were they the same? What did that mean? Hmm. I mean, Americans have some sense of what that means in the 18th century and, you know, in the British colonies of North America. But what did that mean in Grenada? Mm -hmm. to be yeah, so that's interesting. So, um, so we know that. Something, mm -hmm. so, were, they, were they five and six year terms or something? In yeah, that? so they, in Grenada and the British Caribbean, they'll range from one to five years. And if oh, okay. a child was indentured, often they could be re-indentured until they reached 18. Um, and that's the indentureship after 1830s. But if we're talking about indentureship, um, for example, after 1807, this could look, this was more like 14 years under the act for abolition of the slave trade. Oh. And, you know, the similarities of slavery here are really clear, um, longer indentureship. Um, but in terms of the mid 19th century, um, you know, they were provided with rations, but yeah, they weren't able to leave their, their estates. They were bounded to labor on that estate for one to five years, um, restriction of movement. Um, there were cases of definitely abuse and physical yeah. chastisement. Um, and it was all done under a whole legal code, a new legal code was, what right, was created mm -hmm. for venture labor yes yes so this was the indentureship system and you know critical to that is to think about the fact that these were africans that were free um yeah. within africa freed peoples and then they were enslaved um and they were sent to sierra leone or whatever the nearest british colony was and forced to indenture or, or serve into the west india regiment or the royal navy uh for several several years. So they had limited choice about how they would live their lives following their liberation. Um, so their freedom was certainly nominal um, and there were many restrictions. And in some cases they worked alongside enslaved or apprenticed Africans on British Caribbean plantations. Right. Um, 
Yeah, they were part of that long aftermath of the end of slavery in the British Empire, which didn't fully end. <laughs> right, exactly. Right. All right so. well, your audience is so into this. I'll give one more question from the audience that just came in. Uh, mm -hmm. You stimulated all kinds of interest here. I don't, I don't know if you know about this, but uh, Stuart Knight wants to know uh, how far the cola nut actually was exchanged in the Muslim world. Uh, mm. Obviously, North Africa, but even further into the Middle East. How yeah. far in the Islamic world? Maybe you, have, you haven't done that research, probably. I haven't done that research, but I'm sure. But do, does anyone do people know? Uh, yeah, that's a great point. Like Middle East as well. So definitely, Paul Lovejoy has written about oh. uh, the exchanges in North Africa to the Middle East, and it certainly was traded. Um, in the Middle East. So I think that's fascinating to think about, right? These distribution networks yeah. by Africans, you know, outside that Atlantic world. So I would say definitely look at Paul Lovejoy's yeah. work on that. Uh, but yeah, I think that's fascinating. and something that I would like to, again, um, research more as another element in this in this, in this this study. Probably a, uh, an ingredient in the caravans across the Sahara, isn't it? If for no other reason. Oh, definitely. I think the article is called but Caravans of Polo or something. Yeah, Sorry, I mean, what's that? I'm just guessing, but uh, yeah, I think the article is called "Caravans of Cola," so oh, definitely okay. important in that trans-Saharan you know, trade. Yeah, 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 from at least the 13th century, or so thereabouts. Well, I'm, I'm uh, tempted to ask you to explain the relationship of the cola nut to chocolate, since chocolate rules the mm -hmm. world, now, so to speak. Uh, but, but what is that relationship? Hmm, interesting. Okay. I like it that... From cola to some extent, no? Oh no, it's it's not. But it's ah. you know, every time I chocolate yeah, is its own industry. Yeah. It's right, it's a different crop. But when I look at I was in the Caribbean in December, when I look at the cocoa pod, yeah. like cola nut, it's grown in a pod. Yeah. So yeah. It, it does resemble, yeah. And so when you open it like this thick exterior shell, and then you've got the fleshy part and you've got those beautiful yeah. Arranged pods. It's similar. Uh, you can break mixed. it. You know? I thought they were sometimes mixed. Maybe not. I don't no. know. Oh, they're mixed like in beverages, for example. Uh, yeah. I've mentioned a few Scottish, yeah, cola, uh, cola, cola chocolate. Um, yeah, there are people the back... chocolate now, which are probably popular. <laughs> Sorry, say that again. I said there are people who have done histories of chocolate. Now. That's right. Yeah. Probably are part and it is and it is entwined with the cola nut, right? Because Edward Abaka talks about um in his book how coca, you know, becomes to be more dominant. Um yeah. uh, cola is still very bitter. Um and to, to make it sweet involves a lot of addition of sugar. Yeah. For the coca is something different. So that really over overtakes um as a key commodity in the 20th century, hot chocolate. Um yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I had to bring up chocolate. Um, no, it's an important question. I just had a chocolate uh, yogurt for lunch, so I couldn't help it. Anyway, uh, <laughs> tell it's fascinating. What a what a tour of, uh, of you know major parts of the world here through the cola nut, and you've obviously stimulated our audience with lots of. Uh, I don't want to overuse that verb, stimulate, but I did. Uh, anyway, mm -hmm. thank you so much. Say hello to our friends in Glasgow, and uh, you're welcome. To come back here anytime. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much, David. And thank you for all your questions. Um, yeah, sure. Your thank you. Doing. And uh, everyone out there, uh, tune in next time. Uh, I don't know if it's two weeks or whenever our next Wednesday GLC lunches. And Chantel, once again, thanks so much for doing this and take care of yourself. Thank you. Thanks, David. Take care, everyone.